Today we inaugurate the first annual Nelson Mandela Lecture. The lecture is part of a series of events being held this week to celebrate Nelson Mandela, the person and his contribution in creating a better world. The Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture will be developed as a prestigious public lecture attracting the best intellectual voices in the world. It will add to the larger public dialogue on critical social issues. The purpose of launching the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture is twofold. First, it will be an occasion to celebrate Nelson Mandela's legacy. Secondly, it will provide a forum for the critical consideration of challenging social issues that confront us in the 21st century. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to what will be the second virtual Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Wherever you are in South Africa or in other parts of the world, I bring you the best wishes from the trustees and staff of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. I'm here in the auditorium of the Foundation's Center of Memory, a space, a space which has not changed much since the days Nelson Mandela would use it for his bigger engagements in the first decade of this century. Those of us who worked with him, we miss him a lot. We remember the last time he was in this space when he walked out that door late in 2010, walking with his walking stick out, little did we know that would be the last time he'd be in the building. We miss him in a world which is changing so rapidly that simply keeping up with it seems to be a great challenge, both intellectually and emotionally. It is just over a year ago that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed the first virtual Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture and spoke about the need for a new social contract in what he called a new era. Did we imagine then that the next annual lecture would also have to take place virtually in contexts of new COVID strains and continuing lockdowns? For those of us in South Africa, did we feel then even the possibility of the kinds of breakdown in the rule of law which we have experienced in the country recently. What is just beginning to emerge now has, as a global post-COVID era is demanding of all of us, wherever we live in the world, a willingness to imagine a world organized very differently to the way it is now, and a determination to change our behaviors in order to make a world which is livable for all, a world in which everyone is invested in the future, particularly for those who are still to be born, a world which, is, which the rule of law is not restricted in our thinking to a realm defined simply by accountability, order, and the exercise of authority, but instead is fused with a practice of social bonding, belonging, and collective responsibility. As we think back, to the events of July in South Africa. I think the temptation is to associate the concept of the rule of law with interventions made by the police, with the deployment of the military, with arrests of those suspected of wrongdoing, with the restoration of law and order. More important for me was the way in which communities stepped up by saying no to violence. I'm reminded of a young person out in Mahigeng, Re Molosangwe, who stopped it all and said, not in our name, 
would our town be destroyed? By contributing to peacemaking endeavors, such as the work that's being done by the SAHRC and SACC, by supporting law enforcement in the protection of infrastructure, by cleaning up, and by contributing to the work of relief and recovery. It is societal energy and action like this which makes the rule of law sustainable. If a post-COVID world is going to be livable for all, then it will have to draw deeply not only on respect for the rule of law and capacity to enforce it, but also on deep-rooted cultures of collective responsibility, solidarity, and care. How to build those cultures is a singular challenge. In the context of the damage that COVID has done to economies, societies, and societal fabrics, and human psyches, I'm reminded of the statistics released by Stats SA just yesterday here in South Africa, which indicates that a lot of young people are unemployed, and unemployment in South Africa is becoming such a pain. It is a challenge for South Africa. The events of July have given us an indication of just how stark and how fraught this challenge will be. But it is a global challenge too. In so many ways, South Africa is an early warning system for the world. Global dynamics from north-south fissures to climate change, from patterns of inequality to sediments of colonialism, from human migrations to the search for enduring bases for social bonding. Global dynamics are playing out in very concentrated ways in South African society and polity. These are the contexts in which it is so appropriate that our speaker for this year's lecture is Madame Fatu Bensouda, the former prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and that she is speaking to the theme of the rule of law, international criminal justice, and sustainable development. Before the chairman of our board of trustees introduces her, let us pause for a singing of the South African national anthem. I'm wearing a shirt. No, no jacket. Oh, no jacket. A shirt. Over, over, over this. I'm wearing a shirt. No, no jacket. Oh, no jacket. A shirt. Before we continue with proceedings, let us take a moment of silence to remember those who have been lost to COVID-19 around the world and those here in South Africa 
who lost their lives during the waves of public violence in July. We also remember the 23-year-old law student at Fort Hare who lost her life to gender-based violence. Aus Nosicelo Ntebene. We say to her family, we pass our deepest condolences to you. Your loss is not just yours, it's ours too. And to the community of Fort Hare, we're saying, we know you held a memorial in her honor. May we vow that this might be, this is the last death like this. Her death is yet another reminder that South Africa is a violent democracy. And in, her, in, in honor of those people, we must make sure that South Africa doesn't continue to eat her own children. May we have a moment of silence. For today's lecture, Professor Njabulon Debele, the chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees, has contributed a pre-recorded message and speaker introduction. Nelson Mandela appointed him as a founding trustee in 1999, and he continues to serve with passion and with purpose. Please join me as we listen to Prof. I'm wearing a shirt. All who are following today's event from home here in South Africa and from wherever you are in the world. On behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees and the staff of the Foundation, I thank you for supporting the 19th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture with your presence. The world we all live in today continues to change and change so rapidly that both our intellectual and emotional understandings of it and even of ourselves are changing all the time. It is just over a year ago that United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed the very first virtual Nelson Mandela annual lecture and spoke about the need for a new social contract in what he called a new era. The demands of that new era do indeed continue to exert pressures of various kinds on all peoples around the world that this year's annual lecture also takes place virtually speaks to the adaptive resourcefulness of the COVID-19 virus to mutate into new and more deadly strains. This has forced us into lockdowns of various kinds as we simultaneously rethink the way we have lived and how we now face the imperative to have to co-create a new world based on an understanding clearer to us as never before. And it is precisely this, that we are all equal as human beings. Perhaps the greatest imperative of the 21st century emerges from that understanding which is to work together in mutual respect to change the global order profoundly. In South Africa, we have felt the compelling agency of the demands of that imperative. This happened recently when the one thing that we solemnly agreed would be the foundational basis of how we would constitute ourselves into a nation. The South African Constitution 
was brazenly and concertedly attacked. The wave of looting, burning, and other forms of public violence, destruction, and lawlessness, which the entire world will have seen, and which swept two of South Africa's provinces just a month ago, caught many of us unawares. But deep down, as we saw the unfolding chaos, we knew that the kindling for such a fire had been building up over many, many years. The planned, rehearsed, and deliberate disruption of the economic lifelines of our country shocked the entire South African population. Had the perpetrators of these deeds succeeded, they would have demonstrated publicly the blueprint by which they would govern South Africa into a future of more instability, more poverty, more ignorance as the very basis on which they would exercise their control over the South African population. They intended to turn our country into a state without the rule of law. A tin god would have been installed as head of state to become the beginning and the end of his own laws by which he would preside over a full-blown gangster state. The conditions for looting were created with the intention to expose the needy to the chaos under which they would acquire commodities they desired but could not afford because they still lived largely in an economic system and the social conditions that undergird it, which, as we all know, were inherited from a long history of colonialism, imperialism, and apartheid. They also banked on the devastations of COVID-19, which have led to massive joblessness and social disruption. The South African Constitution, a living work in progress, was designed to be the solemn means by which we could alter many unsustainable legacies of our history. In assisting us to carry out this task, the South African judiciary, through adjudication of the rule of law, which covers all aspects of South African life, has been steadfast in its commitment to ensure the integrity of state governance by calling to account the executive authority to honor collectively in word and deed its sworn oaths of office. But it is in the midst and aftermath of the chaos that an amazing social phenomenon occurred. Communities in affected provinces and others around the country came to recognize the organic interconnectedness of the social order in which they lived. In an instance of social insight, they saw that each and every township had a local economy that was the beating heart of their community life. They recognized and began to uphold the reality that it was in the public interest that the neighborhood store, the spaza shop, the local shopping mall, the ATM, the petrol station, the schools, the early childhood development centers, the library, the clinics, the post office, and even the local police station 
and the entire municipal infrastructure, which includes electricity, water, sanitation, streets and roads, the trains, buses and taxis, should always remain open for access by community citizens in ways that have been communally agreed to. They also realize something else. They realize the necessity to end all forms of violence as the means to achieve community objectives, no matter how unhappy some citizens might be. It dawned on our township communities that the governed social order was a public good to be recovered, maintained, and protected. Those of us who live in the current generations carry the greatest responsibility to begin to recreate and restore the integrity of community life to be passed on from one generation to the next. The principle at the heart of social living that township communities have recognized and now uphold is a source of social cohesion that many communities around the country, such as, for example, Abashali Basem Jondol, have known all along. But the reality was something the larger population, even the governing party, was slow or failed to learn from. And it is this, that local communities from which countries are built from the bottom up are the true sources of the authority of all elected government. For this reason, it is the solemn commitment and responsibility of all elected government to demonstrate the will and commitment to apply their hearts, their minds, and their consciences to the expressed needs of the communities that put them in office. Our immediate task as South Africa rebuilds, in my view, is twofold. On the one hand, to deal with the recent sabotage and criminality decisively, and on the other, to expedite the systemic changes which we know are unavoidable, and to do so with a sense of agency greater than ever before, and with the understanding that the rule of law is a central source of social conduct and order. This is also a time like no other before, that in the context of the global impact of COVID-19, the sense of identity that South Africa's township communities have rediscovered is of the kind that all countries in Africa and in what is known as the Global South, its peoples once colonized and oppressed, must themselves recover as the new and purposeful source of authority in the reordering of the global systems of world governance and trade and the movement of people in migratory patterns that have deep historical origins. The moral and ethical burdens of this history must be carried by the entirety of humanity. All of us who belong to plundered worlds should participate strongly and more purposefully in the reordering of organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, rating agencies, and other global institutions 
that in many ways have contributed phenomenally to the structuring of unfair systems of global trading that have over the years led to a fundamentally unjust world order. The truth of this moment has hit all of us, and it is that all human beings, all other life forms on land, in the air, in rivers, and in the sea, are sacred. The ways in which the world is and should be governed in the ongoing and post-COVID-19 periods should reflect this fundamental learning in this global moment. And to begin to appreciate, reflect, and uphold the priceless value of once despised ancient wisdoms. All humanity should work together to achieve a new world order and free ourselves from notions of modernity that have also induced pernicious forms of blindness. It was precisely such global challenges which led the Nelson Mandela Foundation to invite former International Criminal Court Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda to deliver this year's Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture on the theme, The Rule of Law, International Criminal Justice and Sustainable Development. She is uniquely positioned to explore the connections between accountability and sustainability, and between reckoning with oppressive pasts and making liberatory futures. We first became aware of her work when she served in the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. She has just completed what has been almost two decades of distinguished service with the International Criminal Court, including a long stint as the head of prosecutions. She has earned many honors and received numerous awards. We are truly honored to have her with us today. I'm looking forward to Madame Bensoda's lecture with a great sense of anticipation as are my fellow trustees and the broader Nelson Mandela Foundation family. We welcome her warmly to this platform. I thank you. I think you'll agree with me that Professor Ndebele has introduced the lecture and our lecturer with a powerful provocation and a strong reminder of the anchors for law and the rule of law in democracies. Without much further ado, I want to invite Madame Bensouda to deliver the lecture. I have not yet had the honor of meeting her in person, but I've admired her work from a distance and I have had many interactions with her during the planning of today's event. I have to tell you that um, her humility uh, is the thing that humbles you as you listen to her, because uh, she kept on just showing her gratitude for uh, us inviting her. Little did she know we bow in terms of how she has represented the continent and the world. Madam, I can't wait to hear you, and I'm sure I speak for everyone who is watching live with us today. Over to you, Madam Bensouda. for that kind introduction. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by thanking the Nelson Mandela Foundation for inviting me to address this esteemed audience across the globe. I also want to acknowledge my big sister, Grasa Michelle, who is here with us today, and to thank her for the impressive work she is doing in advancing the rights of women 
in Africa and beyond. From those viewing in the host nation of South Africa to those in attendance online, thank you for joining us in these unprecedented times. In the past few decades, I have had the opportunity to deliver notable lectures, but it is an incredible honor to be invited by the foundation to address those who hold a shared vision of advancing the legacy of His Excellency Nelson Mandela, one of the world's greatest public servants and civil rights icons. His life continues to inspire us all as we tackle the multifaceted challenges that face humanity today. During apartheid, Mandela's name became a beacon of light in the struggle against oppression and injustice. With courage on one hand and tenacity on the other, he guided South Africa through murky waters and wrote his name on the sands of time as a symbol of peace and reconciliation, resonating across Africa and beyond. Years ago, as a young girl growing up in the Gambia, a relative of mine who served as the principal magistrate of the city of Banjul always spoke highly of Mandela and his vision to uphold human rights. Many of us across the continent remember hearing songs of praise about Nelson Mandela, whether by Yusundur in Senegal or Lady Smith Black Mambazo in South Africa. Despite being held captive far away in Robben Island, Madiba's voice and principles echoed and guided us. He was present in our conscience and daily lives, embedding in me an innate strive for justice, especially in my early years as a human rights practitioner. The more I learned about Madiba, the more I learned about steadfastness and resolve. His dedication to nonviolence, in spite of his circumstances, remains an upright quality we must continue to uphold in turbulent times, even in South Africa today. I must commend the work of the Nelson Mandela Foundation for keeping his memory and legacy alive by reviving a living archive anchored on peace and reconciliation. As custodians of his life's work, centering accessibility, solidarity, and collaboration across institutions reinforces our global fight for freedom by all means necessary. I should confess that the relationship between international criminal justice, the rule of law, and sustainable development has attracted and continues to engender interesting, but at times very heated and controversial debates. One of those being the classic dilemma of pursuing peace versus justice. During my career as Chief Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, while investigating alleged commission of crimes in areas of armed conflict, some negotiators often believed the ICC's intervention would impede the peace process. I've always been of the view that peace and justice must work together contemporaneously. Prioritizing one over the other jeopardizes the chance of achieving either. As is often cried on the front lines, no justice, no peace. For this reason, I remind fellow human rights practitioners how important it is for communities to understand that the promise of peace comes with justice and accountability. I believe this package is a more sustainable recipe for actualizing Madiba's vision of transitional justice, whether through redress or transformation of political and social systems. We must continue to question how we approach these processes to attain more sustainable and progressive futures. Today, I urge us to collectively examine these probing questions. questions. To what extent does international criminal justice and the rule of law contribute towards sustainable development. But specifically, how can institutions such as the ICC, whose principal object is to bring to justice individuals 
responsible for crimes of concern to the international community contribute to the multifaceted value of peace and sustainable development. Sustainable development means the needs, meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It calls for concerted efforts towards building an inclusive and resilient future for people and our planet. To achieve sustainable development, we must harness our social capital and efforts of civil society on the, on the ground to build a more robust and responsive instruments of change. Goal 16 of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals identifies three key elements, namely peace, justice, and strong institutions. The goal is to promote, promote peaceful and inclusive societies, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And I will address our questions by discussing these three themes. Let me start with peace. At a glance, it is evident that conflict is an ever-present process in human relations, with peace being the desired antidote. As a proud African, I want to see Africa, as most Africans do, a prosperous and more peaceful continent in which democratic values, the rule of law, and human rights are respected and advanced. With over 3,000 ethnic groups and a myriad of languages, Africa is amongst the most heterogeneous in the world. However, this seeming blessing has equally fueled past and ongoing conflicts, often fought along ethnic and religious lines. It is important for governments, especially democratic governments, to understand that their primary duty is to safeguard the rights of citizens, whether economic, political, or social. This is what toils fertile ground for inclusive and sustainable development rooted in values of peace and unity. In principle, any government unable to safeguard these rights has failed to discharge its primary duty. When a government does not invest in human development, namely healthcare, education, and standard of living, the people despair. When a government does not adopt growth-oriented policies, factoring comprehensive social economic challenges, the people despair. When a government runs a sham democracy and fails to take into account the social political plight of vulnerable and marginalized groups, the people despair. You see, despair is no ingredient for prosperity. And without hope, we cannot actualize or activate peace, especially among increasingly globalized and rapidly developing societies in Africa. When heads of state and leaders fail to build solidarity, the people often fall back to tribal or religious divisions, for example, as a reactionary means of survival. In trying to survive, a breakdown of law and order often leads to the commission of egregious crimes by both state and non-state actors. A leader who fails to quell violence, but rather fans the flames of divisiveness should be held account accountable. In such a case, where the parameters of admissibility and complementarity are satisfied, the ICC could intervene. The goal outlined in the Rome Statute is to end impunity and contribute towards lasting peace. Whether through setting judicial precedent or deterring future crimes, it is important to acknowledge the role and responsibility of leaders in the deprivation or realization of peace. I dare to say that the level of greed and impunity on the African continent strongly limits 
our strive towards lasting peace. When leaders sabotage their own countries, do they not have future generations in mind? This short-sightedness fails to anticipate the ripple effect of their actions, not only on themselves, but on the people whom they took an oath to serve. We must hold accountable the perpetrators of neo-patrimonial politics and gerontocratic regimes with outdated imaginaries of the state. And on this note, I invite us to collectively envision what a new liberatory social contract might look like. To begin, we must confront ourselves honestly, as we have, about the root causes of this rampant social disorder. If we all yearn for peace, are our leaders implementing steps towards necessary radical reform? By this, I don't simply mean more steps, but different steps. It is time to see solidarity in action, effective dialogue and response that puts victims first, not politics first. Through his work and lived experience, Madiba taught us that embracing our identity should not come at the expense of humanity. He galvanized a country divided along racial lines under the umbrella of a rainbow nation. Madiba dreamt of a nation where peace and freedom formed the foundational basis of a modern democracy. Towards the turn of the century, he brought promising hope to Africa, the African diaspora, and marginalized people across the world. However, as we know, Rome was not built in a day. Recent events in South Africa have shown that there is urgent work to be done to build a more inclusive society. It is clear that economic inequality and mistrust in public institutions has fueled a hostile response amongst the people. The expanding wealth gap is a clear pointer that we must work towards a progressive economic model that levels the playing field. We must work together to keep the Madiba candle of hope burning in a time where multilateralism, neo-apartheid, and weak pillars of accountability continue to impede sustainable development. Despite the many challenges, there is room for progress to reduce inequality, fight corruption, and restore trust. The legacy of apartheid is a vivid example of the urgency for systemic change. However, this reform must be sustainable, meaning all parties must be served, including those in the margins, the victims, the, the dispossessed, the women, the children. And a propelled spirit of resistance should bring foresight and comprehensive policy building. This also means lifting systematic and institutional barriers by providing equal opportunity for all members of society, including women, in critical decision-making to thrive, reach their full potential, and to succeed. We have a collective responsibility to advance gender parity in Africa and beyond. <clears throat> it has been a commitment of mine to champion the rights of women and children, and increasingly those of younger generations. When the youth are disregarded, both imminent and future progress is stifled. This is a threat to future economies and the sustainable development of our continent and the world. A new liberatory social contract, therefore, would see a world where young people have a seat at the table and they speak boldly on issues which impact our collective futures. In a world where we must learn to coexist in mutual respect despite our differences, we are tasked with the responsibility, not just to learn, but to unlearn, to break generational cycles as a form of catharsis. Above all, we must continue to hold the essence of peace and humanity as sacred in this boundless and ever-changing world. A new social contract would 
require convergence, solidarity, and collaboration between government, non-state actors, and civil society. This calls for not only more institutions, but better and stronger institutions, ones not riddled in identity politics, but driven by the rule of law. Turning to strong institutions, one thing I often say is, the law is my boss. This motto reinforces the concept of the rule of law in my experience as a justice and human rights practitioner. In many parts of the world, bureaucracy has brewed a culture of adopting legislations without implementation. Oftentimes, the concepts underpinning these laws, such as peace and justice, seem abstract, cliche, and detached from the desperate daily needs of the masses. The power of strong institutions lies in their ability to activate these concepts from theory into practice through swift and efficient systems. In my line of work, I have witnessed the ramifications of lack of rapid response to victims and the trauma it brews over generations. Within this process lies the paradox and nuances which institutions like the ICC are tasked with dissecting and resolving. As captured in SDG 16, <clears throat> people around the world need to have faith in the institutions responsible for ensuring justice. Strengthening institutions with a commitment to ensuring their independence, impartiality and ability to set, to achieve set mandates must be the driving force and the rationale behind coordinated policies at both domestic and international levels. As you know, the International Criminal Court is the world's first permanent criminal court holding accountable those responsible for the commission of crimes of concern to the international community, including genocide, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression, war crimes. Over the past two decades, it has developed a body of knowledge that addresses these questions through various opinions and jurisprudence. The Rome Statute criminalizes and seeks accountability for conducts which strike at the very heart of our societies. And these include not only violent crimes against protected groups and persons, but also crimes against cultural property and emerging frontiers to be cut by the Rome Statute system. While examining the relationship between international criminal justice and the broader challenges of attaining sustainable development, it is important to stress that the independent mandate of the court and its office of the prosecutor must always be respected and protected. This institution, seeking justice for victims, should be shielded from political interference resource paucity, and any other internal risks which may threaten its effectiveness and efficiency. As you may already know, some of these issues are currently being addressed by the ongoing review of the court. I strongly believe that intervention by an independent and impartial court as the anchor of, international, of the international criminal justice system plays a critical role in contributing even if indirectly, towards peace, reconciliation, and restruction of societies recovering from the ravages of war and conflict. This intervention not only supports accountability and justice efforts, but in the long run, contributes to the construction of judicial and other rule of law institutions within national legal systems, all of which are critical to facilitating sustainable development. Some may argue that there are no positive linkages between international criminal justice and peace building. A proponent of this school of thought, Hideki Shinoda, notes that excessive pursuit of justice in an unstable society risks undermining opportunities of peace. In opposing the signing of the Rome Statute by the then President Clinton of the United States, one commentator specifically argued that, and I quote, the ICC, 
the wrong instrument for dealing with large-scale war, devastation, destruction, and crimes against humanity. Developing stable democracy societies and limiting the loss of life require prudent political calculations, not judicial findings. He further stated that judgments about individual guilt can point in one direction and judgments about political order and the promotion of peace and democracy can point in another." End of quote. As the ICC engaged in its first situation in Uganda, some vehemently criticized the court for allegedly impeding the peace process in northern Uganda by its issuance of arrest warrants against the key perpetrators of crimes in the region. The criticism and fears surrounding the ICC were aggravated by the fact that the alleged perpetrators had refused to sign the peace agreement to benefit from amnesty in Uganda as long as the warrants of arrest were still in place. These views were and still remain contradictory to the soul of the Rome Statute. The adoption of the Rome Statute demonstrates the clear determination of the international community to put an end to impunity for perpetrators of atrocity crimes that threaten the peace, security, and well-being of the world, and by doing so, aid in their prevention. Let me recall here the immortal words of Kofi Annan. He said, we have little hope of preventing genocide or reassuring those who live in fear of its occurrence if people who have committed this most heinous of crimes are left at large and not held to account. He continued, it is therefore vital that we build and maintain robust judicial systems, both national and international, so that over time, people will see there is no impunity for such crimes. End of quote. If we flip through the pages of history, we are constantly reminded that there can be no healing without peace. There can be no without justice, and there can be no justice without the rule of law. In commemoration of the 1994 Rwandan genocide, the UN Secretary General underscored the importance of justice and accountability in the following words. He said, exposing and holding perpetrators, including their accomplices, accountable, as well as restoring dignity of victims through acknowledging and commemorating their suffering would guide societies in the prevention of future violations. It is therefore important for policymakers, legal practitioners, and all relevant parties to continue exploring innovative ways to strengthen national institutions, including through international cooperation, building capacity with the weapons of the law. There is need to improve how we approach our pursuit of justice in a concerted effort to build solidarity. When we build on lessons learned and best practices, it sets the stage for innovative and sustainable solutions to the types of challenges we have illustrated today. As you know, the effects of war have intra and intergenerational repercussions. But how can the long arm of strong institutions avert and mitigate some of the consequences? When considering the rights of future generations, those that include the long-term protection of humanity through robust and sustainable mechanisms, we must adopt a new precautionary principle, evolving from the punitive law which punishes after the fact to anticipatory law aimed at prevention. Globally, the number of people fleeing war, persecution and conflict currently exceeds 70 million. To combat this comprehensively, new systems must involve diverse factions of society, including across borders. At the core lies the safeguarding of future generations, the young torch bearers of tomorrow. According to UNICEF, about 33 million children have been forcibly displaced worldwide by violence and conflict with an estimated 19.4 million of them within their own countries. 
Furthermore, crimes against children involving the use of child soldiers, for example, call for urgent action at all levels. It is estimated that by 2050, Africa will have the greatest potential among all continents in respect of its young and dynamic labor force. Protecting and cultivating this enormous potential must be a strategic imperative for African countries. In a world where our struggles are increasingly interconnected and the value of preemptive measures is evident, we must engage all critical actors, governments and their institutions, international, non-governmental organizations, and civil society. It would be nothing short of an illusion, of an illusion to think that we can rely exclusively on states to uphold respect for human rights and the rule of law. When governments fail, active citizens moving in solidarity, even across borders, build new orders that propel the vision of a more just world. While I served as chief prosecutor, my office held biannual meetings with members of civil society organizations committed to holding individuals to account for international crimes. This enabled collaboration with external partners for practical pursuit of our mandate. On the other hand, delays in implementation of the reparations mandate of the Trust Fund for Victims and lack of cooperation from situation countries call for greater creativity in addressing challenges that fail to harness a collective and sustainable approach. The emergence of new actors has led to the expansion of frontiers in the field of international law at its intersection with climate justice, data privacy, cybersecurity, and business and human rights, among other fields. And these increasingly sophisticated systems reshape and reform the ways in which we strategize and fundamentally understand our interconnectedness. Let me finally address justice. I recently met with a few young people who asked me the question, are you scared for the future of international criminal justice given the current trajectory? My response was simple. There is nothing to be scared about as I believe in the collective power of those championing the global and constant fight against injustice. Despite the challenges with the multilateralism and cooperation between states and institutions, I firmly believe in the efficacy of international treaties and national instruments. But how do we strengthen institutions tasked with dispensing justice? The causal link between justice and sustainable development is global access to the former without prejudice. The concept of justice conflates the principles of fairness and equity. A just and equitable society is one which prioritizes, among other things, equal access to education, zero tolerance for discrimination against women and girls, non-discriminatory laws and policies, and education on human rights. My primary agenda as chief prosecutor was to ensure that victims of international crimes were given access to justice. I was certainly met with a diamond resistance, needless to recall all the details. The reluctance and rejection of the ICC jurisdiction also contributes to the denial of justice, especially where national systems are unwilling and unable to dispense justice. This is a tool politicians and governments use to prosper their own agenda, even when allegedly committing atrocity crimes. Accessibility to forms of redress is a crucial aspect of sustainable development when it comes to justice. And during my time at the ICC, one of the main challenges the court and may continue to face is dissemination of knowledge about the court's jurisdictional parameters and function. The ICC is a court of last resort. It is an extension of national judicial system in the fight to end impunity. The office of the prosecutor lays it with domestic systems by encouraging and supporting in the context of its core activities, genuine national proceedings and dialogue with states. 
The ICC is not designed to replace national systems, nor is it designed to take over what is primarily their responsibility to investigate and prosecute serious crimes of international concern. It is therefore important that, at the national and regional levels, awareness is raised about how strong institutions working in collaboration can produce better outcomes in the fights against injustice. Various campaigns labeled the ICC as a white man's court on the false premise that the court targets African countries and leaders, but not their global counterparts. This fallacious and unjustifiable claim pushed some African states to attempt to withdraw from the Rome Statute. However, it must be said that there can never be an excuse for impunity. Victims should never be re-victimized. And what surprised me the most about the above events was the lack of discussion around justice for victims of these alleged crimes. The failure to center victims when seeking justice can deter this critical debate from the essential. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, let me conclude. There is more work to be done. We must pursue peace by upholding the rule of law through strong institutions and strive towards a more just world. I remember hearing stories of how Madiba reacted to maltreatment by prison personnel saying, General, I want to say one thing to you. You are a general on the other side, while I am a commander on this side. When we have fought it out and reduced our country to ashes, it would still be necessary for one to accept the surrender from the other, whoever wins or whoever loses. But how we would behave at that moment of surrender would be determined by how we have treated each other now. These are the words of Madiba. Only someone with such integrity and foresight could sustain Madiba's frame of mind. He understood that burning bridges, while always an option, was not a viable alternative in the given circumstance. Preserving these ideologies, as effectuated by the work of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, defines how we recount history on our own terms and shape young minds of today for tomorrow. So I implore us to ponder the bigger picture and embrace the goal of peace, justice, and sustainable development within the framework of strong institutions. Let me end by asking, what is your contribution to sustainable development? We must remember and uphold our collective and individual roles as responsible, as resp and responsibilities as active citizens of the globe. How we choose to come together in soli solidarity, to, bring, to build systems of accountability that strive towards peace and justice can truly forge transgenerational impact and sustainable change. Again, I quote Mandela, as he said, this great rock of Kuno. It is in your hands to make a difference. That's what he said. And for us, ladies and gentlemen, I do acknowledge that more, much work has been done, but there are miles to go still before we sleep. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Bensuda. I could stand here for the whole afternoon just reminding us of how strong your message was. You were willing to say the unsayable, that the long walk should continue even when we are tired, that we must unlearn. And the key question that you left us is, what is your role? What is your contribution? Are you one of those who stand by and just critique those who are doing a lot and just criticize and criticize without contributing anything, nor showing your hand. We must unlearn that culture, that convergence and collaboration is the future. 
but that we must not do more. Rather, we should build better and stronger institutions. As I was listening to you, it was as if you were speaking directly to South Africa, that efficiency of systems is critical for the future of our country. So thank you so much again for also de dealing with the issues that uh, we have been uh, dealing with. Thank you for a very rich and thought-provoking uh, lecture that you have um, uh, been uh, uh, giving us. We are really grateful uh, for the work that you do. I think uh, I'd, I'd like to now uh, uh, introduce uh, the next uh, 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 person who's going to be running the next session, uh, which is uh, Luando Klaso. As you know, Luando is someone we have worked with on a number of projects in recent years. She's a lawyer, a social commentator, and an activist. You're going to feel her activism just now. Her role at the Constitution Hill Trust has seen us uh, collaborating this year on a series of dialogues to mark the 25th anniversary of South Africa's constitution. Over to you, Luando. Thank you so much, Mr. Hatang, for your very warm introduction. What an urgent and timely message from Madame Bensouda, reconciling peace and justice, the necessity of the rule of law, on this, the 19th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, and also the 25th anniversary of our Constitution. On a personal note, Madame Bensouda, my peers and I were in law school as you started your career at the ICC, and we were young practicing lawyers when you were made chief prosecutor, and your example allowed us to set our sights higher. Our friends on Twitter have throughout your lecture been submitting their questions. They wasted no time. And I'm not surprised considering that all the issues addressed in your speech have been bubbling under the world over and particularly in South Africa. So it's my honor to pose some of these questions to you, mixed in with my own questions, of course. Okay. I'd like to start by congratulating you and your team for the Nobel Peace Prize nomination. Considering the challenges you have faced, the complexity of your work, what does this nomination mean to you at this moment? Um, thank you very much, and uh, also thank you for the encouraging uh, words you've just uh, um, said. You, uh, I, I believe, um, um, that we have a responsibility um, towards the younger generation, and uh, and that we must uh, we must send um, always a positive message for them to follow, um, so that when we when we um, hand over the baton, um, you also will be quite prepared to take this on. It's a joint responsibility. So thank you very much for that. Um, this nomination, you, you talked about the Nobel Prize nomination, I am extremely grateful for. And uh, I, um, um, just the nomination by in and of itself, I think is an acknowledgement of the work that together with my office, we have tried to do in the past uh, nine years that I was a prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Um, together with my office, we've worked very hard against many odds, many odds, and against many challenges, but always with the vision that the law must rule, always with the vision that we have a mandate, a mandate to execute, uh, um, to, to be able to uh, ensure that the victims that cry out for justice will have that chance and the opportunity, and those who perpetrate these crimes must be held accountable. And for us, this, has, this is what has always guided us um, amidst, I must say, great political challenges and attacks. But um, as I said, we always have stood the, um, stood the ground and together with the office have really tried to push, push the barriers as high as possible. And uh, so this um, Nobel Prize nomination is really um, uh, sort of even a vindication but also an acknowledgement of the work that has been done. And I am extremely uh, grateful. I know um, those that I've left at the office as well who worked with me side by side are extremely grateful that this recognition has been made. Mm. Thank you so much. Just know that we are rooting for you and your team. 
and uh, hopefully you will win. If you don't, your work speaks for itself. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is your first major address since leaving office. And I'm just, I'm sure we're joined by many others that we're so grateful that you've chosen South Africa as the platform from which you will, I mean, that you have addressed the world. And, um, you know, just to address the elephant in the room that South Africa has had its own run in with the ICC, with the court. Uh, there's been some contention uh, in the last couple of years, but this hasn't always been the case. You know, when the court was established, when the Rome Statute was ratified, you know, African countries were some of the first countries to actually ratify the Rome Statute, with Senegal being the first. We were in the top 10 of the countries to ratify, uh, with Nelson Mandela as our president, and him saying that perhaps if this court had been established earlier, some of the inhumanity that we have experienced on this continent wouldn't have happened. So there's been a lot of backing. But then if we fast forward to 2016, we start seeing the rumblings of maybe African countries should withdraw from the Rome uh, Statute. Uh, countries like Burundi, your home country of the Gambia, South Africa, Namibia. What do you think led to that, um, you know, starting with the support early in the early days and then to the contention? What would you attribute that tension to? And what would you say to some South Africans who think that because we have our own strong uh, judicial system, that maybe we shouldn't be part of um, the Rome Statute? Um, first and foremost, I have to commend uh, Africa and the role that Africa has played in establishing this International Criminal Court. Africa has played a great role, and I could stand here till the end of this lecture to, to, to demonstrate the various ways in which Africa has supported uh, the court, not only in establishing it, being the last states uh, to have uh, uh, make that push, final push to ratify for the, um, to meet the threshold for the court to come into existence. But also uh, the fact that the first cases for the ICC were because Africa trusted the court enough to refer cases to the ICC. So as opposed to what um, uh, people do say that the, all the first cases were there, I always try to remind that it is as a result of the referrals, African countries requesting the ICC to step in, to intervene, to investigate and prosecute. That is why the first cases started there. And then we, um, we also uh, can say that uh, during my time at the ICC, most of the um, uh, cooperation I sought was going to African states. And I can tell you that most of those, that cooperation that, that came back, came back positively, and it was from African states. Of course, there were occasions when they were not in a position to do so, but I can tell you that there was strong cooperation from uh, African states in support of ICC's work. So having said that, as you said, fast forward to uh, in 2016, um, I, I want to first and foremost say that by the nature of what ICC does, mm. the scrutiny that ICC imposed, imposes on heads of states, on leaders, on uh, political leaders, non-state actors, that scrutiny will continue to receive a pushback. And this is actually what uh, happened. And this pushback, I'm not only saying that is it, it comes from Africa, it came from Africa at the time it did. Uh, fortunately, you have talked about um, all these states, different states that have decided to withdraw from the ICC because um, ICC dared to, to want to scrutinize uh, whether the crimes falling within ICC jurisdiction have been uh, committed there, such as my country, the Gambia. Fortunately, I always say the lamb has returned to the fold. That is not happening anymore, or that hasn't happened, and Gambia has more or less withdraw the withdrawal from, from the ICC. Um, and, uh, but the, but that, is, that is really the, the, the fact of the matter. When um, governments or states suspect uh, or see that the ICC is daring to probe into conduct that could amount to ICC crimes, crimes that fall within the jurisdiction of the ICC, there will be pushback. 
If you look at currently where the ICC stands, this pushback we have has come to be demonstrated that it was not only in Africa. Mm -hmm. When we decided to go to other jurisdictions, because our, uh, um, our jurisdiction led us there, you have seen the pushback we are receiving, the ICC is receiving currently. It is clear. So I, I would just say that um, by the nature of what we do, um, by the fact that the crimes we investigate involves very high level um, leaders, the crimes involve thousands of victims, the crimes are so serious that it shocks the conscience of humanity. In the end, those who feel that they will be scrutinized for that court can easily mobilize, Some, most of them are state actors, mobilize for pushback to happen against the ICC. So this should not be seen as a fault of the ICC. Mm. This should, should be seen as the ICC doing its work and doing it properly, doing it with credibility and doing it as it should be done. Mm. And just to maybe keep with uh, you know, the South African context, um, we know that apartheid was a crime against humanity. And we know that when it comes to reparations and um, criminal prosecutions, we haven't fared very well, right? And perhaps I'd ask you that, you know, part of the powers that you had as chief prosecutor is to refer cases to, uh, to the ICC. And uh, knowing what you know about South Africa and not pursuing apartheid era crimes uh, to the extent that the South African people desire, would you, uh, do, do you think there is a case in South Africa to refer to the ICC? And also when it comes to this idea of peace and justice, you know, a lot of people may feel that we have prioritized peace at the expense of justice. And um, if peace is lacking, I mean, if justice is lacking, do you think the peace that we have is even real? I, that's a very uh, interesting uh, question, of course. And I probably wanted to um, draw your attention to the fact that the ICC came into existence in 2002. And this means that any crime that falls within ICC's jurisdiction that occurred prior to the establishment of the ICC, we, ICC couldn't, uh, cannot mm. take, look into those crimes because it was not... Uh, the ICC was not in existence, and the temporary jurisdiction will not allow it to go back. Um, but also, I do know and I'm aware that uh, um, South Africa had made attempts to address uh, this issue, in, in, uh, whether it's through transitional justice or in other form. Um, I'm just saying this to, to uh, um, say, I'm just saying this to tell you that um, our intervention, um, first of all, ICC does not replace domestic jurisdiction. Mm. I mentioned this in my, in my uh, remarks. Mm. And when ICC intervenes, there are also criteria that are set for the court to intervene. When we have referrals from uh, the state itself uh, asking ICC's intervention, um, we, the ICC has to look at uh, whether all the um, criteria is met for that intervention to take place. If there is no referral from the state and the crimes occurring at the moment, for instance, are so important, so egregious that they meet the threshold for ICC's intervention, the prosecutor would look into intervening if nothing is being done at the domestic, domestic level. So um, there is a uh, Really, uh, I, would, I, would, I, would call, I would say that there is a, a, a criteria that is set. There is a framework that is set, which has to be satisfied for ICC to intervene. So given those, it was uh, perhaps um, a bit, um, uh, let's say, not difficult, but this, this, all the circumstances have not met for, for intervention. Uh, we, um, in, in South Africa at the time.
thank you so much. I think that is much needed uh, clarification. And then um, in a question that's been submitted by uh, one of our viewers, Lisho Honolo, he wants to know what is justice? And perhaps if I put it to you, what does justice mean to you personally? Um, first and foremost, justice is everything to me. I, 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 I would uh, start by saying that. But again, um, justice is uh, being able to ensure that there is accountability. Um, there is accountability for crimes, that the, the, the plight of victims is addressed, that there is rule of law, that in the application of justice, there is no discrimination, there is equality. It's a whole host of things to ensure that those who, um, who, those who deserve justice they, they, they get justice. And where we can, what we can do uh, together collectively, again, I come back to the issue of strong institutions. Make sure that we have strong institutions. Make sure that we look at things differently, differently maybe, but always the goal in mind is the law must rule. Mm. The rule of law is what is important. And when the law rules, there will be justice. When all you think about is uh, that the law has to, to be applied across the board equally, then you will see that the law will rule and we will have the rule of law. Mm. It's, it's critically important for, for, for to ensure that justice is done mm. without fear or favor, as I always say. Definitely. Um, and I think the other area that requires some clarification and maybe education for uh, all the viewers and for me is this idea of the United Nations Sec uh, Security Council and the powers that it has to refer matters to the ICC. And as we know, in two instances, Darfur and Libya, it was able to refer cases even though those two are not state parties to the Rome Statute. This leads to a lot of unpredictability when it comes to referrals and perhaps the pe perception of unfairness. Is there a way that there could be uh, predictability in referrals and has anything maybe developed in the last couple of years um, that, that hopefully has addressed that issue of unpredictability? Yeah. In the Rome Statute, um, Article 16 um, says that the UN Security Council can make referrals um, to the prosecutor of the ICC when crimes these crimes that are ICC's jurisdiction, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, occur on the territory of even a non-state party. This is, this is what the, 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 the statute says. And by, by that, um, the UN Security Council uh, is acting under Chapter 7. As you know, when it comes to issues of security, at the highest level, the UN Security Council is the political body that is charged with that. And these referrals, um, I, I, I always think that indeed it was a way of um, trying to bring justice to even those who have decided not to join the ICC. Because the ICC cannot just intervene anywhere. This is something that uh, people, many people don't know. You don't just in, in, intervene in any, any state. It has to be a state party or it has to be a state, a, part, a state that has made a declaration accepting ICC jurisdiction, or it has to be a state that was referred, a situation that was referred to the ICC prosecutor by the UN Security Council. But what I, what I believe and what I have tried to apply always is that when these referrals come to the office of the prosecutor, it should also be handled in the same manner as other referrals that comes to the ICC by ensuring that ICC crimes have been committed, by ensuring that they have reached the threshold which warrants the intervention of the prosecutor of the ICC. And also by even look, looking into, the, into matters such as interest of justice, will it be against the interest of justice if the ICC were to investigate in this situation? So once you have that, once you ensure that that criteria is met, then as prosecutor, you have an obligation to proceed with that case. So I think if one were to, to really handle, handle, this is what I try to do, to handle it in that manner, 
objectively, mm. I believe that there will be pre pre um, predictability, as, uh, as you, you're saying, mm. on how the Office of the Prosecutor will handle these cases. It has to be like we handle other referrals, mm. like we handle uh, um, when, when uh, the prosecutor had to move proprio motto. Uh, this, this must be uh, uh, applied um, as far as I, I, I knew and tried to practice across the board in that manner. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're running out of time. If it were up to me, you know, we could just keep going for another hour. But perhaps the last two questions, um, the one that just came in, uh, Sophie wants to know, looking at the situation right now in Afghanistan, what's your reaction? You faced huge pressure when you launched investigations into allegations of human rights violations by U.S. soldiers. Do you feel vindicated? And on my side, my last question to you is, what are you looking forward to in the next chapter of your life and your career? Um, in Afghanistan, um, it is unfortunate what is happening right now. Um, but uh, I, would, I would just say that um, uh, there are other actors that have, have, that, that have to react right now in Afghanistan. Um, and what I just urge is whatever the case may be, justice should not be set aside um, when, when it is um, uh, when it is uh, practical to be able to do that, it should be part of whatever um, arrangements is taken going forward. So, um, but as I said, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate what is going on, and I hope that uh, um, law and order can be brought about, uh, can be brought back, uh, brought into Afghanistan as soon as possible. And I'm saying this, uh, for the victims. I am a victim-oriented person, and uh, I know that when all of these, when crimes are committed, really those whom we should consider as front and center is those who have suffered these crimes. What can we do to redeem them? What can we do to rehabilitate them? What can we do to ensure that they have justice and that those who perpetrate these crimes are held accountable for that? So, um, as, as I said, I mean, we have already um, announced the opening of uh, investigations whilst I was uh, there. I, uh, uh, it is up to the, the prosecutor now, the, the current prosecutor, to decide, of course, on the way forward with the situation in Afghanistan. And the next chapter for you? The next chapter for me is... Um, you know, I am uh, a service-oriented person. That's, that's what I like to do. And uh, at the moment, I'm increasingly um, thinking about going back to the Gambia mm. and to see how I can contribute further to national development. But that does not mean that um, um, I am uh, going to uh, completely um, ignore the other contributions that I, I believe I can still make at the international level. We cannot thank you enough for delivering such a powerful lecture and for being generous with your responses uh, to our audience's questions and my questions. In appreciation, the foundation would like to present you with these two gifts. One is a bust of uh, Madiba. We hope it will have a pride of place in your home, and we hope to hand it over to you uh, when you come to South Africa, which means you owe us a visit. The second is Isikolo. Uh, we have observed your style, and we think this headpiece will go perfectly with your outfit. May you long remember us in this time that we've shared together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it's, you. It's really very generous of of you for, for, for this uh, gift, especially the uh, Mandela bust. I think that is really uh, something, as you know, will, will be in a very prominent place in my home. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, as we draw to a close, and thank you, uh, Luando, this was amazing. Uh, the, um, I, I was looking at the uh, comments. Uh, someone said, Luando is killing it. <laughs> and the chief prosecutor is uh, just returning the favor. <laughs> so thank you so much to both of you. As we draw to a close now, it is time to invite Mrs. Grassa Michelle
to the annual lecture virtual platform. Of course, she needs a little introduction to global audiences. She's a tireless activist for the rights of women and children, has taken leadership positions for many years, both locally and internationally, and worked hand in hand with Madiba in the last phase of his life's long walk. She has supported the annual lecture faithfully year after year since its inception. We are very grateful to you, ma'am, for being with us remotely today from Mapi Maputo and for agreeing to offer a closing reflection. I have to tell you that uh, uh, mom was here a couple months ago. She was at pain that she wouldn't be here physically. So we know your pain and uh, thank you so much for uh, delivering your, your closing remarks. Thank you, thank you so, so very much for this uh, opportunity. I fail to find the right words to thank you, Madame Bensuda, and let me call you much more affectionately to thank you, Fatu, for such a brilliant, powerful, uh, thought-provoking address you just uh, granted us all. I have to say it was with such joy and I couldn't afford uh, remembering my always, always heart feeling like soaring when I saw you as uh, the chief of the ICC, when I saw you and when I saw um, Mohammed, Amina Mohammed at the helm of the UN, when I saw uh, Ngozi Iwala at the head of uh, WTO, I felt Madiba was so right when he said, and you mentioned this, it is in your hands. You especially, you have been the 
in his footsteps, a lawyer, a lawyer of human rights. And he occupied the top, top institution to protect human rights of everybody. And quite rightly, you mentioned the issue of protecting the victims. And uh, I have to say also, as a woman who participated in the struggle, I feel that my generation has all the reasons to believe that yes, the women's rights also are in good hands. So Madiba said it is in your right, it is in your hands, but I say also it is in your hands, your generation to continue at the top of these institutions and also to build young generations who shouldn't be counted by five or 10 fingers. They should come now in hundreds and thousands as you, you mentor them. I want to take from your address three important things. One is the challenge for us to adopt this new liberatory social contract. It happens that a year ago, Antonio Guterres addressed us as South Africans and the world to adopt a social, a new social contract. And you came with a description of what is this new liberatory social contract. I believe we have a huge homework. In one year's time, we should be able to say, how are we moving to establish this new liberatory social contract? The other issue which I wanted to touch here, which speaks very strongly to South Africa, is when you said there can be no peace without justice, and there can be no justice without the rule of law. All these aspects speaks to the reality we are challenged with in our country. And of course, it speaks also for the rest of the continent and it speaks to the global society. And we are challenged really to take very concrete steps so that we respond to these calls. And we bring our society, for instance, to reduce the levels of inequality, to reduce the levels of corruption, to restore trust in public institution as you quite rightly, you challenge us to do. We have also in our liberatory social contact to move to a situation where women are not going to continue to be brutalized by the levels of uh, what it is today. I mean, gender-based violence, the marginalization of women in the economy. Yes, we have made progress in public institutions, but in our social life, we still have a long way to go. I want to challenge us as South Africa to say, come one year's time, how have you moved to meet or to reduce the levels of what Fatu has challenged us? Yes, we need to continue the convergence, the solidarity and the collaboration between government, non-state actors and civil society organizations. So yes, it was a wonderful, wonderful, I mean, reminder of the work which still has to be done. But more importantly now is for us to take this appeal, to take this message, to transform it into practical programming way in which we can say, as South Africa, this is what we have done to respond to such a powerful, I insist, such a brilliant and such a, I would say even instructive message which you have given us. I want to uh, finish saying, Fatu, yes, you come back home and we will be happy to have you in the Gambia, but you are the daughter of this African soil. So Gambia 
yes, it's African soil as well. But this continent will continue to need your brilliance and your leadership. And we will welcome you and we hope you'll be able to play a very significant role to address all the challenges in global terms, but particularly focusing on Africa. With your expertise, with your credibility, you will be able to push for agendas in which the African continent has to move from making very good laws and adopting very good, I mean, statements, but really to push for societies of social justice as you are challenged us, and in which women will enjoy more and more their rights, in which young women, young people will continue, I mean, to be at the center of drafting what our future is to be. So welcome, and I'm very, very, very proud because I can say, hmm, in my evening days, I could see what the future is going to look like with the young women like you being where you are and playing such, such, such a powerful role for transformation of our own societies. And South Africa, the task is there. It is in our hands and we effectively have to come up with very concrete steps of how we respond to these challenges which were laid to us today. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am, for those thoughts. Uh, I thank you for also reminding uh, ma'am Bensuda that uh, she owes us a visit. She has to come back, if anything, to come and get her gift also. Uh, but you also leave us with a challenge. You never leave us without a challenge. And we are hoping that those who are watching the lecture will see us activate some of the things uh, that uh, both you and ma'am Bensuda mentioned. Um, and so we come to the end of the 19th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. I think you'll agree with me that it has been a memorable one. Our thanks in the first instance to Madame Bensuda. You have given us many fruitful lines of inquiry, and I want to assure you that we will be taking them forward through our dialogue and advocacy program. There are so many people to thank for their support. Please bear with me as I thank one more time Mrs. Michelle and Prof Ndebele for their contributions and for being a constant support to the foundation in good and bad times. Ms. Kwaso, we appreciate the role you played today. And as someone said online, it was lit with you here. So thank you very much. And also for your contribution to the pre-lecture -dial dialogue last week. Without our sponsors and our other institutional partners, this lecture would not have been possible. So I acknowledge the International Criminal Court, the South African Embassy in the Netherlands, our ambassador to the Netherlands, I can't thank you enough, Ambassador Vusi Madonzela. When I make that call, you just obliged. My good sir, we are obliged to just thank you one more time. To Derko and the GCIS, Z Africa Hayes for hosting us uh, for free, basically. The Hans Seidel Foundation, Vodacom, Samsung, Brand South Africa, to two fellows, I must say that um, they opened a few doors, uh, being Mireille, Mireille and, um, and Jackie. Thanks, both of you, for what you did. Black Motion Promo Production, the AHA Agency, uh, Flow Communications, Meropa Communications, the Avatar Agency, Cube Design, Digital Girl Africa, Video Vision, our media partners, our sign language interpreters, we can't do this kind of work without you. Presidential shirts, you will agree that both Prof and I look good today because of presidential shirts. Uh, Luando, our again, our gratitude. The musicians, uh, I was Jessica Mbangeni, Zoe Mudicha, uh, Pilani Bubu, this year's class of live commentators, including Otilia, um, Tanvir, uh, Advocate Litohonolo, Mokorwane, and Jamil Khan. So thanks to all of you for the 
work that you have done with us. I am, as always, grateful to the Nelson Mandela Foundation team for its commitment and hard work. You always go the extra mile. I wish I could mention each one of you by name. And now we'd like to turn to this afternoon's entertainment, a powerful lineup of, of, a lineup of women artists to close this year's inspiring lecture. After all, what would the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture be without music? As Madiba once said, and I quote, music is a great blessing. It has the power to elevate and to liberate us. It sets people free to dream. It can unite us to sing with one voice. Such is the value of music, I close. Um, especially given the richness of today's address, let us nourish our souls with music. First, we have none other than award-winning Jessica Mbangeni. La Tompulu Kihamba. La Tompulu Ka. La Tompulu Kihamba Lentevu. La Kwam Tikaka. Yakun Nablele Kwanyiki Mutukela. What Sangum Sanga Kwanga Kut Sabama Tolom Tonyama. Kuma Zelo Kwatete Si. Ya sigini mbaguno nesi, ya sigini mbaguno nesi, ima zembele mte, ima zema bela bongleo, kukungangu sindu watunge, nenge tama zentu kangeko, kangeko kazomu kahala, kahala kama ndela, kampaka nyiswa, kachonkindaba, sit, ah, talipunga, ah, talipunga, ah, talipunga, Hey! Wow. Now we have another award winning artist in the form of none other than Zoe Mudiha. Zoe is such an authentic artist who challenges the status quo and ensures that uh, she uses uh, her, her music to tell a story. Welcome to the stage.
Now we move to South African Music Award winning singer, songwriter, storyteller, and creative artist, Pilani Bubu.
dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of time. Just like holes ringing high, still I Twenty twenty one. Thank you so much, uh, First uh, Pilani. You know, when one when, when one listens to you, one forgets when you, one sees you promoting housing and stuff like that. Twenty twenty one is the twenty fifth anniversary of our constitution, and we, as the foundation, have the mandate to promote constitutionalism. We have taken it upon ourselves to use music as a vehicle for activism and social justice. In closing this year's Nelson Mandela Lecture, I'd like to share this music video, which is a ZAR uh, Rights Ama Piano Anthem collaboration with Nolosi Odisha, which, if you like, is a way to then encourage you to buy our range, which then helps to change communities. If you'd like to join us and buy such range, please visit nelsonmandela.org. Thank you all for being with us today. We wish you well wherever you are in the world. Go well and be healthy. Please get vaccinated if you can. I thank you very much.
Tina Bandu, Tina Bandu, Tina Bandu, Tina Bandu, Africa, Tina Bandu, Tina Bandu, Tina Tina Bandu, Tina Bandu, See us, see us, 